<laughs> Joe, we're going to start with this. Uh, you say, after election day, do you plan to share who you voted for? <laughs> Specifically in regards to the presidential candidate. Sure, if anyone cares. Yeah, why not? Uh, I ask. Now, I, I, I vaguely remember this too, Joe. I ask because I remember you saying you might refrain from, from sharing who you voted for after seeing the kind of responses you got in 2016. I think you made the comment back in late 2017. And it was one of those co topics that came up on Live Me. Oh, man, I remember that platform. Yeah, of course, I could be misremembering stuff here, but I got curious. So I vaguely remember what you're referring to as well. And I think I wasn't so much speaking as responses I got as just kind of like responses in the ethers. Um, and I think it was just that was in response to, you know, after 2016, society lost their collective minds and they forgot all of a sudden that the Electoral College was a thing. They forgot all of a sudden about the concept of strategic voting if you're a lefty. Let me explain what I mean by that. See, before 2016, and I'm old enough to remember what it was like before 2016, before 2016, if you were on the left, it was just expected that you voted strategically, meaning that some people were going to vote for the Democratic candidate, other people were going to vote third party because they knew that we needed a better tomorrow where we didn't have this duopoly. Because when you keep relying on the lesser of two evils, the lesser evils get more and more and more and more evil. And we're seeing that happen. It's gotten to the point where we're, we're supposed to choose between a neo-fascist and a neo-con. That's what lesser evilism gets you. But they twist your arm to where you're in a situation where you just kind of have to go, well, what do I do? What do I do? And it used to be that people who lived in what were called, quote unquote, safe states, it was almost just assumed they were going to vote against the duopoly. And, and I don't like the term safe states, by the way, because that assumes that there's something safe about the Electoral College. And let me tell you something. There is nothing safe about the Electoral College. It's a system that was meant to appease slave owners. There's nothing democratic about it, and we need to do away with it. Uh, and I've never heard uh, an argument for the electoral college that makes any sense. Well, what about the people in rural America? That's not giving them a say. Yes, it is. One person, one vote is having a say. Second of all, how insulting is it? Like, I mean, when people defend the electoral college, making it out like they're defending rural America or basically anywhere outside of a major city, I actually think they're being incredibly insulting to rural America because how insulting is it to assume that every single person votes the same way if they don't live in a major city for president? That anybody, everybody in a small town votes exactly the same way for president because they don't live in a major city. That's so insulting to people. And as somebody who has lived in small towns in the Midwest before, I've lived in the Midwest before, I've lived in the South before, I've lived in the Northwest before, and I live on the West Coast now. I find that so incredibly insulting, and I've traveled all around the country. I mean, it's like, what do you think happens? Do you think everywhere outside of New York, LA, and Chicago, people gather, and they're like, well, we just got together at the Cracker Barrel right after church, where we've all been going to the same church for 50 years. And we all decided this year we're all voting for Trump. Do you think that happens? You think there's people in small town? I've met people from rural West Virginia who voted for Jill Stein. And who vote for Greens constantly. So, yeah. It, it, and that's one of the many reasons why the Electoral College makes no sense whatsoever. None. One person, one vote makes infinitely more sense. But anyway, um, but we have the Electoral College. And because of that, um, people would always just vote strategically until 2016, where everyone just lost their collective mind. And now we're kind of seeing the effects of that here in 2020. And I will say this, the amount of bickering that has gone on 
about whether or not people are voting third party or whether or not they're voting Biden has counterproductive is an understatement for what it's become. It has become absolutely ridiculous. You log on to Twitter. You know, I think that someone asked me, I, I did like an impromptu AMA yesterday on Twitter and someone asked me, they were like, what do you hope is next for leftist media? Which is a broad blanket, like leftist media. What does that mean exactly? I don't really know. But, you know, my honest response was hopefully less bickering and more planning. Hopefully less bickering, more planning. And what I mean by that, you know, you see so much back and forth about I'm going to vote for Biden because I'm holding my nose. And if you don't vote for Biden, you're selfish. And then on the other side, well, I'm not voting for Biden. And if you do vote for Biden, it means you're a sellout with no integrity. And once again, you see like minded people canceling each other over whether or not someone's voting for Biden one way or another. And to me, that is so insanely counterproductive because you know what's really going on? It doesn't, someone who is voting for Biden is not being, uh, is not, it doesn't mean they're automatically a sellout with no integrity. Similarly, someone who's not voting for Biden, it doesn't mean they're selfish. You know what it does mean? It means that there's a judgment call to make and it's a really shitty, 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 should I say shitty a fifth time? Judgment call. And people are making that judgment call. And I tweeted months ago, I was like, look, some leftists are going to vote for Biden, some aren't. It doesn't mean one group's right or wrong. It just means there's a judgment call to make, and it's a horrible judgment call to make. And your anger should not be at the voters. Your anger should be at the system. The system that forced these repulsive choices upon us. And it's by design. They want us to continue bickering with each other over the bullshit system instead of changing the bullshit system. That's what they want. So this ridiculous bickering over whether you're going to vote Biden or whether you're going to get vote third party. I'm not saying it's not a conversation wor uh, worth having. It's a conversation worth having, sure. But when it's just nonstop bickering and nonstop, you know, I'm going to cancel this person. Uh, it's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. And, and let me tell you something. In the toolkit of change, electoralism has a smaller role to play than people realize. A much smaller role to play. Direct action is the best action. Lee Camp tweeted that recently. Direct action is the best action. And he's freaking right. And the way I look at it, it's like we need true systemic change. No matter what happens in November, we need true systemic change. There is no other choice. There is no other option. And that's going to take efforts from the ground up. And what do I mean by that? It's going to take alliances in your community. It's going to take mutual aid. It's going to take um, grassroots political efforts. It's going to take cause-based initiatives. It's going to take direct action. It's going to take activism. It's going to take charity. It's going to take protests. It's going to take strikes. All those things are infinitely more important than whether or not someone on the left is going to hold their nose and vote for Biden or, or vote third party. It's like the left or just, you know, the progressive movement, whatever you want to call it, people that want systemic change, basically. It's like we're a catering company and we got the job of a freaking lifetime. We, we have such a huge job ahead of us where we are cooking for this massive amount of people and we need to knock it out of the park. And we are spending 95% of our time bickering over a garnish where we're faced with two horrific choices for a garnish, and we got to pick one of the two, basically. And some people are saying, well, this is the less shitty garnish. We're better off with this garnish. It's still an awful garnish. It isn't the garnish we need, but it's less shitty than this other garnish. And some people are saying, you know what? Neither one of these garnishes are acceptable. We need to fight for a better tomorrow where we have better options for a garnish that go beyond these two horrific choices. So we're going to pick a third garnish and we're going to rally corporate uh, to make sure that this third garnish is what, and then other people are saying, no, 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 we can't do that right now. We got to just pick. And instead of just saying, well, you know what? Cast your vote for garnish, cast your vote for garnish. 
Some of you are going to pick a different Gardish and rally corporate for a better tomorrow. I get where you're coming from. Some people, they're going to pick the less shitty Gardish. I get where they're coming from. We can agree to disagree on strategy. Just cast your vote for Garnish. But in the meantime, let's focus on making the best meal possible so that whatever not ideal Garnish we're stuck with, we can live to fight another day. Instead of doing that, what we're doing instead is we're spending 95% of the time bickering about the Garnish to the point where we're not making the pasta. We're not perfecting the sauce. We're not uh, perfecting the glaze for the protein. We're not perfecting the vegan option. We're not making a killer salad. We're not roasting the beets perfectly. We're not doing what we need to do for the Brussels sprouts. Can you guys tell that I eat lunch immediately after this stream? Can you tell? And I get it's not, um, you know, it's not a flawless analogy, but that's basically what's happening here. Instead of focusing on the systemic change that really needs to happen, regardless of whether Biden or Trump is president in November. Instead of putting more focus on that, people are spending so much time bickering over electoral politics uh, that it's really stopping the things that we can do. And again, I'll go through that list again. I'll go through the metaphorical list of what we're doing of, uh, of preparing the meal. Preparing the meal of a lifetime. I'll go through that list one more time. Um, forming alliances locally. Direct action. Charity. Grassroots efforts. Cause-based initiatives, especially when it comes to the climate. Uh, direct action. Protest. Strikes. We needed a general strike yesterday. We needed a rent strike yesterday. And it takes organiz organization for something like that to happen. That's what needs to be the focus, more so than electoralism. Electoralism has a smaller role to play than a lot of us realize. And I myself am guilty of this. And even if you're going to look at electoralism, you know what matters a lot freaking more than the White House as far as what you can do to start systemic change? Local. Local. Your city council. Your mayor. Your congressperson. And then state. I'm certainly not excited about what's going on for the White House. I'm not excited about that at all. And I desperately wanted to avoid this situation. I think everyone did. But they were able to cheat again, weren't they? But I am excited about the possibility of Angelica Duenas winning. I am excited about the possibility of Shahid Buttar winning. I am excited about some of the initiatives that are on the ballot. And again, most of those initiatives come from grassroots efforts. And, you know, a turning point for this show, and I know this is a very long way to answer Joe's question, but uh, a turning point for this show was when we interviewed Red from the Community Relief Corps. Check out that interview if you haven't. Red is a, a mutual aid organizer who has dedicated his life to that type of work. And I find it so annoying when, when you see these people on, well, I'm going to do the brave thing and hold my nose or, and vote for Biden, or I'm going to do the brave thing and, and vote third party. All right, guess what? Guess what? Bravery has nothing to do with a ballot box. Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. It takes zero bravery to fill out a circle with a pen. That takes no bravery whatsoever. What that does take is some strategic planning, some mental energy. And as long as you're spending that energy, I don't think it really matters what decision you make. And you might disagree with me. And that's okay. Because at the end of the day, we still want the same things. And direct action is what matters most. Investing in movement for a people's party. Breaking the duopoly. That's what matters most. And uh, you want bravery. Again, listen to that interview with Red. Listen to that interview with someone who has dedicated their life to mutual aid work. Who knows 
that the end for them is likely going to be jail or worse. That's likely how it ends up for people like Red, who are doing that type of work, who are dedicating their lives to mutual aid work and engage in civil disobedience when they need to. But they do it anyway. And they don't care. That takes bravery. That's bravery. Going to a protest when you know you might get arrested. Organizing protests when you know they might try to throw you in jail. That takes bravery. Trying to create a society where people are able to strike. That takes bravery. Organizing in your community. Look, look at someone like a Mel Tal Karebne here in LA. He was on this show. It's been a while. That guy through his own organization provides homeless people with showers and clothing. Doing what that guy does takes bravery. That's bravery. Going up against the duopoly, that's bravery. I mean, I'm not saying don't think strategically about voting. I'm, I'm saying do all those things. That's great. But don't use it as a vehicle to ostracize other like-minded people just because they may have made a different strategic decision than you have. And don't use it as a reason to pat yourself on the back. Come on. And I'll tell you what, after that interview with Red, I have tried to take this show in a, in a different direction. And uh, I'm not going to say that we don't talk about electoralism at all. Of course we do. We, we kind of are right now. But how much time do you think someone like Red spends bickering over whether or not to vote for Joe Biden or vote third party? How much time do you think a digital rights activist, the, the people people like Fight for the Future who are holding our front line front the front lines on digital rights? People who are out there for Julian Assange right now, on their own dime, out there for Julian Assange. How much time do you think they spend bickering about electoralism? I'm going to go with very little to zero hours ever. Very, very little or not at all. I bet that's how much time. So that's why I've kind of gotten away from those conversations. <laughs> and that's why I've just kind of stayed out of it. You know, I, I've and I've been... I've been the same way. I'm like, look, it's the system's fault, not the voters' fault. And I've gotten emails from people saying, Ron, what should I do? Should I vote for Biden? And I'm like, you got to do you. You got to take all the factors and you got to make a judgment call. I'm not going to validate you one way or another. That's not that's not my place, first of all. So, uh Yeah, again, to quote one of Lee Camp's recent tweets that, that I think sums it up best, direct action is the best action. And whatever happens in November, the most important thing is that we continue to try to break the duopoly. And that's going to take a big movement. And that's going to take coalitions. And that's going to take local alliances. And that's going to take direct action. And that's going to take uh, protests and activism. And all that stuff is going to feed into an alternative electorally, which I'm hoping comes in the form of movement for a people's party. And we have a viable option to confront the duopoly and break it because the duopoly can't keep going because if it does, I mean, we're on path now where eventually it's going to be Donald Trump Jr. running as a Democrat and the Republicans will run a Mussolini hologram and you'll have to choose between the lesser evil. So the duopoly can't continue. And it's going to take a huge movement to break that duopoly. It's going to take a movement for ranked choice voting. I mean, all the things I've named, that all matters. And participating there is infinitely more important than what strategic decision you make regarding voting or not voting for Joe Biden. 
infinitely more important. Bravery is not determined by what you do inside of a ballot box. Bravery is determined by what you do outside of it. You want to talk bravery. You want to talk courage. That's bravery. That's courage. Not what strategic decision you make when you're filling out a ballot. So that's my take on it. <laughs> that's my take on it. Um, but yeah, if anyone's interested in, you know, what I'm going to do, sure, we can talk about it. Uh, that's fine. Get your news on with Ron. Did you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Get your news on with Ron. Did you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tweet me an article at Ron Placone. We'll go through it together and make